way to thank you for the year. Um, we know that every Saturday you got up at 6 in the morning and drove your kids to tournaments. And we know that you also didn't even get to see them. So this might actually be your first time seeing your kids' piece or debate. And we're really excited to give that opportunity. Uh, so sit back and enjoy the show. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boobies and gills, to Nile High School's production of Sea Stars. Well, I don't mean to be shellfish, but our submarine is about to leave, so we better get going. Sure thing. All aboard. Woo! <laughs> it's the underwater world of forensics. Cool! Wait, what's that? Well, <laughs> it's the combination of speech, debate, and inter. Tonight, we, the underwater forensics team, are going to be taking a journey under the sea and exploring the events of forensics. Sweet! Let's go! <laughs> Holy barnacle, Batman. It's time for DOA with AJ and Katie. Uh, and DOA is an official speech event when uh, para performers uh, act out a literal piece or a pro program. There are two rules in DOA. One is, you cannot look directly at each other. The second one is, you cannot touch each other. I see now, this is really thin. I'm hooked. Wait, <laughs> what's that? How are we gonna catch 
the Batman. We are help, my pretty. <laughs> Batman's doom will be the law. Two 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 Glover Avenue. Oh, the new book. I'm sorry, Batman. I'm afraid the kid's underage. It's the law. This could be a plot to. Don't worry about me, Batman. You go on inside, and I'll watch on the bat scope. Anything I can do for you, sir? A large, fresh orange juice, please. Coming right up. Looking for a friend or an enemy? Well, maybe you can help me. See, I've got a little problem. I'll say. How is an orange like a bell? Well, well, what must have taught you to rule? The answer is, it takes two to make it. Like beautiful music or dance. Shall we? Your orange juice, sir. Batman special. It's the next clue. How is an orange like a bell? What does it mean, though? That's the problem. See, we all know how the quizzical criminal operates, leaving confusing clues meant to confound us. Clues which may or may not lead to the real crime. The real crime? Precisely. Uh, the Riddler contrives his plots like uh, artichokes. He's got to peel off spiny leaves to reach the heart. But surely it must be some sort of political plot against Voldovia. A mere ruse, Commissioner. A clever ruse to get you to call me. But why would he want that? You're his deadly nemesis. He has a strange artistic compulsion to- I've got it! The meaning of the clue! Because they both must be peeled! Of course! You peel an orange and you peel a bell. The Peel Art Gallery. Why couldn't we have figured that out? Men, call your boys. They got that Beale Art Gallery like a circus tent. Not so fast. The Riddler's up to something tricky here. Better let us handle this. Smells like a trap to me. Robin? Yes? To the Batmobile. Roger! Da -da 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 Our debaters work really hard on their cases, 
and uh, research a lot for these. And so here is Stephanie and Hannah uh, to show you how it's done. Lincoln Douglas debate, so we're going to be starting off with a, a three minute affirmative speech, Hannah's affirmative, and then we're going to have one minute of crossfire, because we're going to be asking questions, and then we'll have a five minute speech for me on the negative, and then we'll have another one minute of crossfire where she'll be asking you questions, and then she'll finally finish up with a two minute speech on her side. Yeah, uh, so quickly, LD debate is uh, very centered around uh, morality and making crime, uh, right and wrong is heavy on philosophy, so that is what LD specifically is about. So, I'll start. For today's debate, I stand in firm affirmation of the result. Public aquariums are morally justified. My value for today's debate is life. We cannot achieve any other goals or pursuit without life. It is what enables us to create progress. Life is a value that every living thing holds. It is for this reason that life is what should be most valued in this debate. My criterion is utilitarianism. Uh, utilitarianism is the philosophy that actions which provide for the greatest good are morally correct. The criterion, uh, coupled with my value of life, means that I am arguing that public aquariums are morally justified because they provide life to the greatest amount. Uh, first of all, I'll also briefly define uh, aquarium, which is a building open to the public in which, many, in which different fish and other water animals live and can be studied. My first contention or point is that aquariums benefit marine life. A successful aquarium has a large variety of fish, especially exotic ones. Therefore, aquariums have a financial incentive to protect rare or even endangered marine animals. Uh, another point is that aquariums double as both an exhibit and a place for scientific research. There's marine biologists and others who are invested in fish and their safety who often work uh, to study these fish and ensure that they can help them. Uh, certain animals that would not be able to survive uh, in the wild or are harmed or have certain illnesses can be helped and have a chance to survive in aquariums. My second contention is that aquariums benefit, benefit humans. Aquariums are a place where people can appreciate the diversity of life. According to the Journal of Environmental and Behavioral Science, aquariums increase visitors' happiness. Quote, the psychological measures show that the benefit of aquariums continued over the entire exposure. People got happier and happier, basically, end quote. People being able to appreciate fish in this way leads to an increase in empathy towards marine life conservation as well. It increases the people's happiness and also makes them more prone to health efforts, uh, environmentalist efforts to help fish and marine life survive. Uh, it is for these reasons that aquariums are overall beneficial to life uh, and the quality of life of both humans and fish. It promotes this and enables it to happen, whether that be through the appreciation of fish that humans can come to realize or their increased happiness through aquariums uh, as well as for the fish, are they giving fish that, and uh, other marine life a chance to survive when they otherwise wouldn't, uh, and putting money towards conserving that life, uh, as well as re research uh, funded by the public to enable that. And it's for these reasons that aquariums are morally justified. I'm now open to cross-examination. Right. So does anyone ask the fish if they want to be studied before they start studying the fish? Uh, no, fish do not have consent, uh, so they cannot be asked. And so we must measure what would be in the most beneficial for them. But don't you think this is hurting the fish's liberty? Like, what if the fish doesn't want to be studied? 
uh, this isn't a choice the fish has in the same way that a fish doesn't have the choice to be out in the ocean or survive like that, or injured fish don't have the choice to be left on their own. So you agree that this is harming the liberty that the fish has? Uh, yes, it, the, however, I also argue that fish do not have liberty. All right, mm -hmm. so let's move on to another question. So don't you agree that there's more to life than just being alive? Yes, but that is overall the most important thing. And I stated in my case how not only is it about keeping fish alive, but also enhancing the quality of life for both species. But what if a fish doesn't want to be alive? Don't you think that's removing the fish's freedom? Uh, fish do have the option. There's been no evidence that fish uh, can be suicidal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be going over my own case, and then I'm going to proceed, and then I'm going to proceed to attack my opponent's case. So, my own case. I stand in firm negation of the result. Public aquariums are morally justified. My value for this debate, or in other words, the philosophical concept that I think is the most important to uphold, will be natural rights. English philosopher John Locke defines these rights as essentially the rights to life, liberty, and property. My criterion for this round, or in other words, the philosophical theory which I think we should use to achieve these rights is Locke's second treatise of government, in which he states that if one's rights are not protected by the government, then the people are morally justified in overthrowing that government. I uphold this stance with the following two contentions. First, aquariums remove the life, liberty, and property of the fish and other animals in these aquariums. And finally, second, the animals in aquariums are eventually going to realize the lack of rights that they have, and thus revolt and harm the life, liberty, and property of the humans running these aquariums. So let's begin with my first contention. First, the aquariums are removing the life, liberty, and property of the fish and the other animals in them. Let's begin with liberty. Perhaps this is the most clear one, as my opponent clearly recognized in, our, in Crossfire. First of all, liberty. What happens if a fish is in a tank and they want to go somewhere, but they're not able to because they're in a tank? Because they're in aquariums, fish aren't able to swim where they want to, penguins aren't able to water, waddle where they want to, snakes aren't able to slither where they want to, dolphins aren't able to dolphin where they want to. <laughs> so essentially what we can see is we're hurting the liberty of these animals. These people are, these animals are losing essential freedoms that every person is guaranteed. And what are we doing by this? We're saying that animals are less than humans. This obviously isn't fair. And this feeds into my second point. We can also see that fish are losing their property. What happens if a fish decides that it doesn't like the rock in its aquarium, in its tank? Is it able to move that rock? No, because it's not allowed to own that rock, even though it clearly lives in the same vicinity as that rock. So we can see that by living in aquariums, fish are being deprived of their essential rights to property. So, so far we have two out of three rights that these fish are losing by being in aquariums. But let's look at number three, life. We can see that if fish are being in aquariums, obviously they're going to get upset about not having any freedom and not having any property. So although my opponent has said that there isn't any evidence that fish are suicidal, can she really back this up with evidence? We can see that she hasn't. So we can clearly see this is harming the life of the fish. So therefore, we can see that we hurt not only the liberty, but also the property and the life of the fish and animals in aquariums. And therefore, my first intention, that we are hurting the natural rights of the fish in these aquariums, still stands. So let's move on to my contention too, that the animals in aquariums are eventually going to realize that they don't have these uh, rights, and using Locke's treaty, uh, using Locke's treatise of government, are going to revolt against the people running these aquariums, and thus wreak havoc across human society. Now, what we can see in Locke's treatise of government, second treatise of government, is he essentially says that if a government is unjust, then the people, or in this case animals, under that government have the right to revolt and overthrow that government. Now, what we can see is that dolphins, uh, many of the animals in aquariums, particularly dolphins, are extremely intelligent. So sooner or later, they're going to realize that they don't have the rights that they should be getting in these aquariums. And especially given how intelligent they are, it's no surprise that they're going to turn to Locke's second treatise on government to tell them what they should do. So what are they going to do? They're going to overthrow the government, which has been keeping them in these tanks. And as a result, we can see this is going to wreak havoc across human society. And what is this havoc going to do? Well, it's going to remove the life, liberty, and property of people across the globe. So not only are we removing the life, liberty, and property of the fish, we're also removing the life, liberty, and property of all the humans in the world. So clearly we can see that um, public aquariums are not morally justified because of the fact that they're not only hurting animals, they're also hurting humans. But now let's turn to my opponent's case. And since she's saying that uh, aquariums are morally justified, she says that her value, that she values the most, is life. But I not only look at how life is going to be harmed by aquariums, I also look at how liberty and property are going to be harmed by aquariums. So therefore, her value falls under mine. We're both valuing the same thing. But as you'll continue to see, I've better supported it throughout my case. Additionally, her criterion is that we're trying to give 
uh, we're trying to provide life, we're trying to provide this to the greatest number of people. But if it's going to be hurting humans and animals of all different kinds, we can see that this isn't going to be giving life or liberty or property to the greatest number of people by any means. So let's move on to her contentions. First of all, that aquariums benefit life. Obviously this isn't the case. If suicidal fish are you know, not going to be happy, then obviously we can see that this isn't benefiting life. Additionally, she mentioned scientific research. But do fish consent to be researched on? We ask human beings if they want to have research performed on them. Do we ask fish? No. So obviously we're removing the liberty of these fish. This clearly isn't morally justified. And so my, my opponent's first contention, or main argument, falls. And then finally, she argues in her second contention that it benefits humans. Well, first of all, as I've shown, this isn't actually the case. Maybe in the short term it is, but in the long term, it's only going to wreak havoc on human society. <laughs> but beyond that, we can see is just because people are being happy through aquariums, it doesn't mean the animals in those aquariums are happy. So therefore, you have to vote negative today because of the fact that not only is this going to remove the life, liberty, and property of fish, it's also going to remove life, liberty, of, and property of human beings. Thank you. Look at the cross. <laughs> okay. Uh, are fish citizens or subjects to a government? Well, it depends on whether they were born in the United States or not. If they're born in the United States, then they're the United States citizens. If they're immigrant fish, then they're Isn't not the citizens. Isn't the ocean international waters? But see, that would make them immigrant fish. Now, if they were born in the United States, then they would be United States citizens. If they didn't receive their citizenship, why should they be guaranteed uh, life, liberty, and happiness by a government uh, that does not uh, control them or uh, need to provide these things to them? Well, under your definition of aquariums, aquariums aren't technically, the public aquariums don't have to be run by the government. So therefore, essentially, we can see that not only, first of all, these rights are universal, but we can also see that since these aquariums don't belong to any specific government body, that therefore these rights should be, uh, these rights of these fish and animals should be protected regardless of what country they're in, and regardless of their citizens of that country, or whether they're immigrant fish of that country, or anything. Would you say that a fish, a uh, suicidal fish, possibly being able to receive psychological care of an aquarium versus just fending for themselves and possibly uh, committing suicide in the ocean, that the latter is the better option. But if they're not able to consent to receive psychological help, what if they don't want to have psycho psychological research performed on them? Clearly this is harming their freedom. And now I think we're out of time, so. Yeah, so then I'll go to my last speech, which is uh, defending my own case and attacking uh, my opponents. First I'll begin by uh, attacking my opponents. Uh, so I judge briefly in crossfire on this, but basically my entire opponent's case falls because fish are not citizens or subjects uh, of a country, and therefore they do not have a government that is ruling them, and uh, under even Locke's theory of government, or treaties of government, that whole idea is a contract between the government and the fish. And because there is not that contract, and even they say fish can uh, possibly can't receive consent, or they're not consenting to this contract. Uh, so because of this, the entire case falls with fish being uh, due these guarantees of life, liberty, uh, and property. Also, uh, on, well, that is the majority of my opponent's case, but also talking briefly about suicidal fish, <laughs> of I could mention, of also this, of, uh, I, have a, I do have a rebuttal to that of, uh, personal evidence of seeing a fish, a suicidal fish in person at an aquarium who would eat rocks uh, until, uh, in order to try to escape its life. <laughs> Moving on, I'll <laughs> to uh, defending my own case. Uh, in general though, fish, uh, and even the attacks made on my case of fish wreaking havoc on humankind, uh, and fish being able to rebel and such, uh, they are not the ones who will wreak havoc on humankind. We didn't see through the environment of really humankind is doing this to fish. And the aquariums create environments where there's more sympathy towards fish and also a safe space in a way for fish uh, where they do not have the risks of oil spills or plastics or other uh, environmental concerns that do need to be fixed. However, uh, a short-term a short-term solution to helping these fish live and live a better life is aquariums. And also, as I said, that benefits humans as well. And my opponent doesn't show any evidence of fish uh, rebelling against humans if that hasn't happened in aquariums. Uh, <laughs> and more so of humans getting enjoyment from the fish. And we can't really measure fish's happiness or claims to property. And so we just need to uh, focus on their life, since that is what is pretty binary, and we can tell. 
Uh, and it is for these reasons that aquariums are morally justified. Thank you. <laughs> That was magnificent. No, it was superb. Magnificent. Superb. Magnificent. Superb. Magnificent. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Superb. Slow down. This next event will keep your focus and calm you down. Presenting original oratory is Evan Roberts. Original oratory is a persuasive seven to ten minute speech written by the performer. I am obsessed with sloth. Yes, sloths, those weird little creatures who live in the trees and don't really seem to contribute to society in the least. And it's not because they're super fuzzy or have big eyes. It's not even because they look so funny with their crazy long legs. It's probably because they move so very slowly. Yeah, that's what everyone knows about sloths. They spend their lives moving at a leisurely, relaxed pace. Wow, relaxed pace. In a world of overnight shipping and fast food, we don't get much of relaxed, do we? Unlike sloths, we've been racing through life at breakneck speed, and when things aren't ultra fast, we become more and more impatient because of it. We've lost the ability to step back and look at life from a different point of view. So let's do that. Let's take a look at the day in the life of a sloth. As we explore how impatience is present in our lives, why it's a problem, and find a solution, Let's see if we can learn something from our friends, the sloths. But before we delve too deep in the problem of impatience, let's meet the sloth we will become today. The sloth is an animal commonly found in Central and South America, whose special adaptations for conserving metabolism have them move at less than 0.15 miles per hour. However, what many don't know about sloths is that they are incredibly strong. After all, their mode of transportation is swinging through the trees only by their arms. There is great strength in sloths just as there is great strength in patience. But impatience in our daily lives seems much more prominent. It's present in every aspect, from the day-to-day -to, -day to the long term. We get frustrated when waits for restaurants or roller coasters are too long. We pay extra for apps that eliminate lines, options, and time spent in general. We have finished essays or projects or quit jobs and relationships they don't stay interesting enough for long enough. A common theme here is that with impatience, indignance also comes. When things don't go as we want, particularly as fast as we want, we tend to lash out at the world around us, whether this be the cashier in front of the grocery line that's going too slow, or the driver in front of you in bad traffic. No matter what, we respond with anger and frustration. This isn't good for ourselves, and this isn't good for those around us. When we lash out, we can hurt relationships, cause accidents, and otherwise make poor choices. And if we try to go against this norm, the society we're trying to change will go against us because of it. After all, sloths are named after the capital sin of sloth, describing someone who is overly slow and lazy. Fast-paced society rejected these animals just as they have rejected patients. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If everyone in this room was waiting for a video to load on the internet, half of us would be gone by now, according to a study by Ramesh Teraman, a computer science professor at UMass Amherst. Ten seconds. On the grand scale of our lives, our year, even today, or this speech itself, those ten seconds really aren't going to matter. So why is it that half of us can't wait just that amount for a video? Studies show that impatience doesn't become a problem unless we have a goal to work towards or something to be impatient about, whether this would be writing a paper, getting through work, or just finishing that one math class. We don't have something to be impatient about until we have a goal or deadline. Ah, deadlines. The reference to death in the name itself can apply to our sleep habits or happiness, but they can also apply to the amount of patience that we start our task with. And this could seem like an easy thing to avoid until you realize that goals and deadlines make up a part of who we are. Now, let's try to say a way that we can fight against this norm of impatience. Be the sloth climbing up the trees. 
It'll take us a long time to get to where we need to go, and we'll be fighting against forces of nature, but it is imperative that we make it. The need to become patient is more important now than ever. A study released by the Journal of Biosocial Science shows that our motivation for eating healthy has been affected by our lack of patience. We hear everywhere that America is becoming more and more unhealthy. Our obesity rates are going through the roof. When we think about it, it makes sense. After all, the organic, family-owned restaurant has a much longer wait time than the greasy, salty, fast food place next door. It also shows that if we crave a basket of french fries or an extra dessert, our instant gratification wired brains are much more likely to give in and let us eat it, as opposed to waiting for the future benefit. It's a scary thing to think of, but at least it's been brought to our attention. Studies like these might not be around forever. If we continue this trend of impatience that we're on, those who conduct studies on social behavior like this will give up before they reach their goal, and we can enjoy the benefits. And if this will happen with social sciences, who's to say we won't give up on exploring the universe, or lessening the effects of climate change, or finding a cure for cancer? Impatience can hurt our day-to-day -day lives, but it can also hurt the growth of our society as a whole. So, how do we fix it? Impatience isn't a part of our lives that can be fixed with the push of a button, or a wave of a wand, or even changing a single element of our day. But the application of patience is easier than we might want to believe. We have asked that we can't eliminate goals altogether, as they are a significant part of our lives. But what we can do is set and approach goals in a more practical manner. We can find time to budget our time and lessen the effects of stress, which will have us enjoy what we work on more. The more we enjoy something, the less likely we are to give up on it. If we plan correctly, goals can be healthy. And health is another part of our lives that can benefit from the implementation of patience. By choosing to have more organic or meals that might take a little longer, you will have a little longer wait time that night, but it will impact us greatly in the future. In general, thinking of future benefits is really what can cause this trend of impatience to stop. Every time we have to make a decision, just stopping and thinking. Thinking of the pros and cons of giving up or of continuing through. Something that can help with decision making is taking 30, 20, even 10 minutes to yourself every day for yoga, sleep, meditation, rest, anything that just calms your mind. Not only will this lessen stress, but when it comes time to make a decision, you will already be conditioned to taking time to put your mind to yourself. And if every one of us changed the impatience in ourselves more, patience in our society will grow. When we think of important characteristics, characteristics that make up our role models, people we look towards, we think of responsibility, honesty, kindness. All of these can be lost with patience, but none are lost on sloths. Like sloths, patience is a virtue that's often overlooked or underrated. But without them, our world would be a completely impatient one. And is that a world we really want to live in? Thank you. Wow. Jeez. You should really try it sometime. Oh, I caught it. Yeah, I guess it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> you guys know extemporaneous? Yeah, but why don't you explain it to the audience, just for the hell of it? I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't know what it is. <laughs> extemporaneous speaking is when a speaker is given 30 minutes to prepare a topic based off of offline sources, and the speech has to be from 5 to 7 minutes. So without further ado, here's Eileen with the next step. resource and not the other resource. And while many people think that we need to develop into the space frontier, I argue that we actually need to develop into the ocean frontier for three main reasons. First, 
It's more accessible to develop into the ocean. Second, it's more productive to do so. And last but not least, it benefits humanity more for us to be developing into ocean exploration. Now the first thing we need to consider is the accessibility. The ocean, however wide, however deep, is still on Earth. And we can have a we can develop machines that can don't have to go all the way into the ocean. On the other hand, from Earth, the closest the closest astronomical body is the moon. And the distance is more than thousands of kilometers away. In fact, between the Earth and the Moon, you could fit in all the planets of the solar system. That's how far away the Earth is from the Moon. The ocean is far more accessible in terms of developing machines, and developing submarines into exploration. We don't have to go all the way to the bottom of the ocean. We can develop, we can, uh, we can explore parts of the ocean, but we don't have to go all the way down. And that's what makes the ocean better than the ocean. But the other part of this is that the ocean is more productive in terms of exploration goes. We can see that the ocean utilizes more scientists in order to explore. Biologists can study the life forms that exist on each climate of in each se section of the ocean. Chemists can study the composition of different elements in different sections, and physicists can study the pressure, the the different environments for the fish to live in. However, when we go to space space exploration, not all of these are utilized. For example, biologists no longer have a field to study. Chemists have a more limited field because they're only able to get limited samples, while space is arguably best, best for physicists only. By exploring the ocean, we allow more scientists to develop their skills to learn more, and that's another reason why we should be developing ocean exploration rather than space exploration. But last but not least, ocean exploration is going to be vital for the survival of humanity. With, ocean, with changes in the ocean and changes in the ocean's temperature, humans are way more effective than changes in space. If an explosion happens, for example, in a faraway nebula, then humans are going to be less impacted by, say, a geothermal event uh, increasing the temperature of the ocean. Oceans have many species that are central to human survival, fish and other, and other creatures that humans use to not only for consumption, but also for exploration, for development, for studying how humans live. And it is not necessary that we study these before we go out and study these space. In conclusion, ocean exploration is more vital to the survival and future of humans than space exploration, especially in the near future. Say so space exploration is not only costly, it takes too many resources and doesn't utilize our resources efficiently. And it is for these reasons that I argue that space should be not should not be prioritized over over ocean exploration. Thank you. Right now we have an intermission, so please enjoy yourselves, and we'll get back soon. And you earlier tonight you saw a fantastic uh, LD round, and I'm going to be coming around and collecting your votes on who won. And we'll find out in our next half. Feel free to mingle around, look at our baskets, and grab some food. Thank you. Thank you.
and those yeses. But what else do you do? You love him and he loves you. And I will tell him that I am here for him. And I will tell him that I will stay. And I will tell him that my face lay. He's got 60 years to live. He's got 60 years to live. 60 years to life, 60 years to life. Incredible. I don't know. Those jokes were kind of fishy. <laughs> um, you're just really crabby. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? I'm seeing sea stars. Okay, we need to move on to our next event. Informative speaking performed by Vision. Informative speaking, you have seven minutes to perform a speech about anything informative on a board that you get to set up. Vijay will be coming up here to perform a speech on Indian classical dance. Thereby eliminating all evil. 
Now, Lord Shiva is part of the Triforce of Gods, including Lord Vishnu, the sustainer of life, and Lord Brahma, the creator of life. Parvati, the goddess of love and devotion, is the wife to Lord Shiva. Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, is the wife to Lord Vishnu. And Saraswati, the goddess of wisdom and knowledge, is the wife to Lord Brahma. Some of the other important gods include Lord Ganesha, the remover of all obstacles, and then Lord Krishna, a mortal form of Lord Vishnu who loves to play tricks on the village girls. And of course we can't forget about Murugan and Bali, the two that starred in our love story earlier. Now at this point, we know what the story is. But in order to be a storyteller, you have to be able to tell the story. So let's now look at the aspects of Bhardhanatyam that allow us dancers to storytell. Bhardhanatyam is composed of three main components, Dritta, Natya, and Ritya. Nritta is essentially the basic steps. They come in the form of something called Aru. That is an example of an Aru. Now, Arubus can be connected to form jatis, and if they're combined in really long sequences, then they make something called kurmas. The second component of Bhardhanatyam is Natya. To me, this translates to the actual story talk itself. Dritta is more like the transition between the story parts, while Natya is the actual story. There are two main components of Natya, abhinaya, or facial expressions, and then mudras, or hand gestures. When I was younger, we would be tested on the mudras. There were the single hand gestures with one hand, and then the double hand gestures with two hands. Each gesture has its own specific meaning. Alapadnam, for example, can represent the blooming of a flower, and Tripadakan can represent a fire. The other aspect was Abhinaya. Um, dancers must use the Nava Rasa in order to convey emotions and make the audience feel certain things. Rasa is essentially the human state of mind. It is what is felt and then expressed on the face as a concept. In Bharatanatyam, there are nine key moods or rasas, and they are as follows. Shringar, Hasya, Karuna, Raudra, Veera, Bayanaka, Vivatsa, Adbhuta, and Shanta. This is my favorite part of the dance because this is where you become the characters that you're telling stories about. Let's take a line from our love story as an example. She shyly observed the man and questioned his identity. Here, I have to use the Abhuta Rasa as Bali knows who Lord Murugan is. And then I also use, have to use mudras in order to convey her actions. The third component was Nritya, which is actually just a combination of Nritya and Natya in a dance. Most part of the Natya dances fall under this category. It's pretty simple. Another aspect that would be really useful to understand with this dance involves the music and the costume. The music is classified as Karnatic music, as this is the traditional singing in India. In a performance, a dancer would typically perform with a musical troupe consisting of a singer, a flautist and a violinist who work together to create the background music, and then a mridhagist, who coordinates the beats of his drum to the dancer's steps, which are actually highlighted by a key accessory. The chalange go around the dancer's ankles like so, and they resonate when the dancer beats on the stage floor. We wear these in order to simulate the bells that Lord Shiva wears while he dances. This is just one of the many examples as to why we dress so intricately, even if it does take four hours just to get dressed for a performance. <laughs> we want to connect to the ancient traditions. It's sort of similar to how the Japanese may wear a traditional style kimono, or how a Christian bride wears white to her wedding. Finally, we've come to the point where we know the story and how to tell it. But there's one key thing that's missing from all of this. The best storytellers are the ones who are able to leave behind a lasting impact. So let's now look at the lasting impact of Bhardhanatyam. Like any chronicler of time, a storyteller adds flourishes here and there, but they chronicle history. Bhardhanatyam dancers are no different. We tell stories about the gods, and this not only allows us to instruct others about the gods, but it's a way for us to chronicle their history. Also, Bhardhanatyam is a form of dance, and just as you may appreciate music or cooking, dancing should be appreciated too. And we've already established that Bhardhanatyam is a form of storytelling, but why should you care about any of this? The answer? We use storytelling in everything we do in our daily lives. Let's say you're a disgruntled teenager, for example, trying to explain to your teacher why you could do your homework. You need the skills of a storyteller in order to tell them and hopefully convince them of an extension. With Bhardhanatyam comes a whole new facet of storytelling, gestures. 
coupled with the right words, you just might wiggle your way out of a potentially harmful situation. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a group of people in a little beautiful room called the Grange. There, they learned about the ancient components of a dance, including Ritha and Nakya. It was then revealed that this dance was also a cultural wonder, as well as a way to pass on history. But that was not all it was. It was also a form of storytelling, and its name was Bethany. Thank you. I bet this next performance will be brilliant. <laughs> but it seems like we've done all of the events. Water, water, water. What are we missing? Poetry. You're missing poetry. Just like a lot of people do. It's a lot like that uh, humor piece that you sh uh, saw in the case that it's interpreting literature. But instead of prose, it's poetry. It can be humorous, it can be dramatic, really whatever the person performing it decides. Now presenting Claire. We did an experiment with static electricity. We rubbed balloons on our heads and stuck them to the walls. Kissing you is kind of like that. I get knocks in my stomach, I get all nervous, and my hair, it stands on end. And I want to tell you really stupid stuff, like kissing you is being shot by a dart gun made of hummingbirds that shoots darts made of hummingbirds. And when I can't kiss you, I shuffle around my apartment with my eyes closed. I change light bulbs with my teeth. I make out with toasters. And if you were a 300 pound professional weightlifter and I, a Kia Sorento, you could drag me anywhere with those lips. Because baby, you remind me of the time when in the second grade Bethany Hogkirk called me a freak face and stabbed me in the arm with a pencil. Because kissing you is kind of like that. Unhealthy and will probably end in disfigurement, but baby, bring on the facial scars and lead poisoning. <laughs> Come over tonight and we'll shuffle around my apartment. We'll drift towards each other like two tectonic plates made out of kittens. Because when I kiss you, I'm flying out of a window, exploding into a cloud of robins, and reappearing on the ground with my mouth full of feathers. The best way to get to heaven is to take it with you. Henry Drum. Our headlights float across the West Texas Highway. Out here, they only have two kinds of, kinds of music on the stereo. Western and country. <laughs> we sing along to parents or to songs our parents taught us. Pay attention, Steve Cliff. Her braid touches my shoulder. Steve Cliff, pay attention. The road begins to curve away from me. As we clip the guardrail, our headlights go skyward. We are astronauts returning to earth, our car spins, it flips, the sky, the riverbed, fight for supremacy. And as we land, we dangle like marionette dolls from our seatbelts. We unbuckle them and fall to the ceiling that was never meant to be a floor. Her collarbone is broken, the same one she broke as, at six years old. And as I sit there, going in and out of consciousness, she speaks to me from just behind the gate. She says, all that has ever mattered is volume. And if you turn the volume up past the point of sound, you will hear me again. You will hear my whispered I love yous through the cracks of the canyon surface. You will hear me again, and you will know 
that this, this is heaven. This is heaven. And you will remember where I hid my love letters. Why I could only speak in short sentences when I was around you. You will remember my middle name. You will remember my legacy. This is heaven. Heaven is not the hand of God reaching down and plucking you from your earthly shell. Heaven is here in these last half seconds, in these last moments before you die. Heaven is an already exhausted force, laying down to die. Heaven is floating to earth in this already shadowed. Well, that's the tail end of our performances, or as we underwater fren forensic cases would say, the tip of the shark fin. That's an awful closer. Tell a better I don't have one. I guess you'll have to be more. Pacific. Okay, just stop looking. Thanks for coming on this underwater journey with our speech debate and inter kids. Be, uh, feel free to stick around for what's left of the snacks and the winners of the silent auction. Uh, thank you for coming. Wait, I have one. It's too late. No, but this is really true important. <laughs> you got a better opportunity. <laughs> Of the silent auction of the yeah silent auction. So. <laughs>